Okay. Good evening. Welcome to our midweek Bible study through the book of Isaiah. Uh, remember that uh, the, the series of Isaiah, I'm calling the, the whole book Judgment and Hope. And we certainly will be getting that tonight as we go through chapter 28 in the book of Isaiah. Calling this those drunkards. <laughs> uh, so let's pray as you make your way to chapter 28. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that you would anoint your word with the same power, the same authority, as when it was originally given to the prophet Isaiah. Lord, we ask that you would uh, anoint your words with power to give us, um, let the word do in us what it's meant to do. Lord, it was, it was given for a purpose and given to bring them, bring to their attention, Lord, certain things. Father, tonight, may you do the same thing. And you may you also give us comfort um, through your word, we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, chapter 28 sort of stands alone. Um, we've been following sort of the, the, a lot of these chapters we've been going through have been grouped together. Um, uh, with certain things. This one's kind of all, all by itself. And when I first read it, it was like, oh, okay. And then I had to read it over. It's like, hmm. And then read it some more. Now, oh, and then studied it some more. And like, wow, now. So it went from hmm to wow <laughs> as we get into this. So um, just like the word of God, it's great. Um, you know, we, we trust that the Lord not only inspired the words themselves, but also even its positioning in the Bible. You know, who knows how the book of Isaiah was was put together, but yet I'm sure <laughs> got to be under the direction of the Holy Spirit who um, inspired not only the words, but also the, um, uh, the, the collections, the way the passages are collected. So anyway, here we have um, Isaiah 28. And um, the prophet is speaking to all the peoples, uh, both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, let me uh, reverse a little bit and just just get a little hint so that you are fully aware of what um, what it's talking about and who is being referenced to. I, I think most know this, but it can couldn't hurt to have a little review. Uh, you know how I like history. Uh, um, after the death of King Solomon. King David's son, uh, the nation was split into two halves. The nation of Israel with uh, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin remaining uh, faithful to David's line, and the other ten splitting away. Uh, the, the ten are uh, north of Judah and, and uh, Benjamin, and so we call this the Northern Kingdom. It's probably the best term for it, but it goes by many different terms. Um, uh, here in this passage is called Ephraim. Um, most often we think of the Northern Kingdom as Israel and the Southern Kingdom as Judah. Um, and we think of the northern kingdom as Ephraim the same way we think of the southern kingdom as Judah, because Ephraim was the largest tribe in both uh, population and um, area uh, land area. It was big. You know, big. The Lord would refer to the northern kingdom as Ephraim. Also referred by um, her capital, which was Samaria. The southern kingdom, Judah, was often referred to by her capital, Jerusalem. So you get the same things going. So tonight, um, Ephraim and Jerusalem will be addressed um, in, this, in this chapter. Hmm. So he is um, giving them a warning. 
He's given them a warning that unless they change, judgment is going to come. Um, and the Lord's given them plenty of warning. When judgment finally did come, when both nations, northern and southern, fell, they had no excuse. They had been warned and warned and warned. The Lord was long patient with both both sides. But he kept warning him, unless you repent, unless you change, this is going to happen. You're going to fall. And they thought, and they just didn't pay attention. And sure enough, things fell. Well, the Lord at even is the same to today. God gives us and our societies warning. He said, unless you change, judgment's going to come. Um, so this is very um, right up to date warning as well. So this, this um, chapter is in two halves. The first 13 verses is directed toward Ephraim. And the second half from verses 14 to 29, the end of the chapter, is directed toward Judah. Uh, and God uses some very vivid language to get their attention, especially in the north. And uh, the hope is that Judah would learn the lesson of her northern neighbors and uh, change her ways so that judgment wouldn't come upon themselves. They did for a while, but eventually they didn't. So let's jump in to um, chapter 28, verses 1 through 4, talking about judgment coming to the drunkards of Ephraim. It says, ah, the proud, proud crown of the drunkard of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, sat on the, the head, the crown of, of a very rich and fertile valley. In this valley were many vineyards, uh, wine growing um, amongst other things, and uh, they made good use of all that wine and just became drunkards. Verse 2, Behold, the Lord has one who is mighty and strong, like a storm of hail, a destroying tempest, like a storm of a mighty overflowing waters. He cast down to the earth with his hand. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot. And the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley, will be like a first ripe fig before the summer. When someone sees it, he swallows it as soon as it's in his hand. <laughs> uh, so the Lord calls his people of, of the, the northern kingdom drunkards. It's, uh, it's kind of a, he's, he's being sarcastic. Uh, towards the uh, both religious and political uh, leaders of the northern kingdom. But just as alcohol makes, uh, makes one stupid and makes you lose sense, um, these rulers were senseless. Whether or not they were actual alcoholics or Drunkards is like he's just saying the type of people they are. You're people with no sense, no care. You're not heeding the warnings. You're not, um, you, you, you're just drunk and numb to what's going on. Uh, they're dulled to the danger that's looming before them. Uh, the danger that they're bringing on themselves by their actions and attitudes. Uh, we know a little something about um, politicians who are drunkards. Our local uh, British uh, ruling party has gotten into great trouble for their um, drinking parties that they had, especially during the center of uh, COVID with all the restrictions 
they thought they were above the rules and uh, especially the people and they had many drunken parties um, so you know long as the way the, the longer things go the less they change you know it's same is true today. We might say, you know, oh, wow, the proud drunkards, uh, drunkards of London, <laughs> you might say today. Um, so you can just be in this. But it said, one who is coming is mighty and strong. This is referring to the Assyrians, the Assyrians who would come and, and after a difficult, horrendous siege, uh, conquer. Samaria and conquer and end the northern kingdom. Uh, they're coming mighty and strong. Uh, and it says in verse four, the proud, uh, or three, the proud crown, and four, the uh, glorious beauty that they had is all going to be crushed and fallen, and and go. The people had great pride in their um, glorious achievements, in their building. Uh, it, they had a magnificent palace in Samaria. They've had many political and military achievements, but would all come to nothing. It's no more than a fading flower. And fading flower is not very, well, of course, it's not very pretty, not very useful. What do you do when you have a, a bouquet of flowers that are starting to wilt and turn brown? You pull them out of the vase and you throw them out, throw them in the bin. That's basically what God said he's going to do with these people. So uh, verses 5 through 8, the next section, judgment will come. That day, the day of the Lord will come to them. We read in verse 5, in that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people, and a spirit of justice to him who sits in justice, judgment, excuse me, and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed by it, wine, or uh, the versions say they are confused by wine. They st uh, stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. Disgusting, isn't it? I mean, it's really just a disgusting view of how the people are acting. God, you know, the, it, they may have had a, a beautiful front, you know, where the fancy clothes of, of government and, you know, show off the rich, uh, richness and that, but God sees the heart. And it's just what they, what their heart is and what they're doing is just disgusting to him. And so he brings it to light, puts it out in the open. As I said, in that day, that's a term for a day of the Lord. As I've said in the past, um, a day of the Lord is a time of, of when God moves, uh, usually in judgment, um, but it can be in salvation. It can be, it's a time of a great work of the Lord. It's time when, time's up. It's the day of the Lord. The Lord's moving now. You've, you, you've brought him, um, brought them on. So that day that it's talking about is the attack and uh, against Samaria and the conquering of Samaria by the Assyrians. You know, as opposed to uh, the, the, the uh, drunken Ephraims and with the fading flower, you have the Lord coming, a crown of beauty, diadem of beauty. And he comes with the spirit of justice as opposed to the priests, the judges, the rulers who were uh, overcome with strong drink, confused by wine. You know, especially, you know, this is not only the rulers, but the priests, the religious rulers of the day are, are being exposed and condemned. Um, 
anytime he tried to use an unscriptural method to get peace with God, uh, an unscriptural way to get salvation, to come into a relationship with God. It's confusing. It's blurry. It's, you know, <laughs> um, reeling, staggering with strong drink, as he said. And what's the result of their confusion? Tables full of filthy vomit. That's what God thinks of unscriptural, ungodly ways to come to him. Let's move on. Let's get out of this. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out of this this ugliness. So it doesn't really get better. Um, you know, he treats these children, and they, they they see he treats these people of Ephraim, these rulers and and priests and teachers and judges and people um, with contempt. You know, he, he tr has to treat them like little children, little children. As we read in verses 9 through 13. To whom will he teach knowledge and to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast. For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, here a little, there a little. He goes on and says, for by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people, to whom he has said, this is rest, give rest to the weary, and this is repose or peaceful sleep. Yet they would not hear. And the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Well, not a good message to the people of the Northern Kingdom, and it certainly did happen. And like I said, he, he you know, he, he I, I like Isaiah. He has a way with words, and he doesn't mince his words. And I, I don't know, his his humor kind of appeals to me. I think it kind of appeals to the British humor too. You know, sort of the the, the using sarcasm and irony and in that. But uh, you know. Here he is, you know, so who should he teach? He says, well, little children just weaned off their mother's milk. You know, little children. I'll treat you like a two-year-old. You know, you're not getting it. So let me get very simple and repeat over and over and over again the same thing. The same thing again and again. And the people go, oh, he's, God's treating us like we're little kids. Yeah, <laughs> that's what he's saying here. <laughs> he says, but who will get through to them? Verse 11 says, it's by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people. He had to get the people of the northern kingdom out of the promised land and into exile far away under the, the, the thumb of the, uh, the cruel and, and strict Assyrians. And so he spoke to them through the foreign tongues of the Assyrians. Um, it took the same thing to get hold of the people in Judah down south. Uh, the Lord spoke to good king Hezekiah through the Rabshakeh of the Assyrians who came and spoke blasphemy words, um, you know, just puffing words and, you know, words of, of, of threat um, personally on that and words of blasphemy against the Lord. 
And Isaiah took these words spoken in his own language by a person of foreign tongue. Um, he, they wrote him a letter and he took this letter and spread it out. Hezekiah. Hezekiah. You said Isaiah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, King Hezekiah. Uh, spread it out before the Lord in the temple. And God came through with a, a great and wonderful work for them. And so, you know, the same thing, precept upon precept, line upon line is repeated two times in here. And I kind of see the first time, like I've said, as being negative. It's being, I'm um, treating you like little children. I have to repeat and repeat and repeat the same thing over and over because you're not getting it. But here, then it's repeated again in verse 13, this last verse to the, to the northern kingdom addressed to them. I think it's positive. It says, um, and the word of the Lord will be to them, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And that's the best way to um, take on God's word. That's the style that we use. It's called expositional teaching. You take a book of the Bible and you teach it line upon line, verse by verse. Um, precept, idea upon idea, as you take it as it comes along. And that gives um, rest and peace to the soul when you have regular, consistent, um, meaningful, and logical teaching. It gives rest to the weary, as it says there in verse 12. Well, this is the first half. This was the message to the northern kingdom. Now, the rest of the, of the chapter and the chapters that follow through chapter 31 are addressed to the southern kingdom, to Judah. Um, here using, calling them the people of Jerusalem. So this next section, it becomes Jerusalem's turn. This is uh, next section is verses 14 through 17. It says, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol. We have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Therefore, thus says the Lord God. And get this, this is the key for the golden verse in this chapter. Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste or will not be disturbed. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and waters will overwhelm the shelter. Well, first it said something kind of confusing, I'm sure, when you heard it. We have made a covenant with death. Um, this is referring to the alliances that the people of the north and the people of the south made with the nations around them. To seek help against the Assyrians, the people of, of, of Judah made an alliance with Egypt. Uh, the people of the north made an alliance among themselves with Syria and the Philistines against them. And they thought by this, they've cheated death. They thought this is, this is going to give us the strength. Um, when, you know, the whip comes through, it will not affect us. Um, uh, we've, we've taken a shelter in this. They thought they had cheated death. But it was not so. Human methods could never cheat death. Human methods could never uh, work the righteousness of God. Human methods fall short. It took God's method to truly cheat death, to truly defeat death, 
to truly make a covenant with man. That's why he promised the Messiah in verse 16, when he said, Behold, I am the one who was laid as a foundation in Zion. You understand that key word, what that means. Who's Zion referring to? Jesus. Jesus. Yep. You could put Christ in there every time. And it it works. So therefore, I am the one who is laid as a foundation in Christ. A stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be ashamed. Uh, Peter quotes this very verse in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, where he says, for it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This term here uh, in Isaiah means to be put to flight, to have to flee in fear, to leave in haste. Uh, to be disturbed from your life and to not have peace. It's just the opposite. Whoever believes in Jesus will be at peace, will be in peace, and will have their peace with God. Another great verse referring to this is Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9. Zechariah 3, 9 says, for behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, a single stone with seven eyes, referring to God's word, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. A very strange work, a very alien thing. Well, God said in this section in verse 17, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. True justice is only found in Jesus. <laughs> and the plumb line refers to the word of God. So the, the righteousness is, is, is in the plumb line. How to get the plumb line is to to follow the straight way, the narrow way to Jesus. We get it from the Bible. And we get it best when it's taught, verse by verse. <laughs> All right, next section is uh, uh, verses 18 through 22. The Lord will break through. He goes on to say, Then your covenant with death will be annulled. And your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When, you, when the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. As often as it, this overwhelming scourge or whip, passes through it, it will, it will take you. For morning by morning, it will pass through, day by day and by night, and it will be sheer terror to understand the message. They thought they had, had, you know, made a deal with the devil to get out of trouble, you know, go in the ways of the world, but it's going to come right back and beat them as often does. There's only one way to, to be in peace and to be safe, and that's to trust Jesus. It goes on to say in verse 20, for the bed is too short to stretch oneself on and the covering too narrow to wrap oneself in. In other words, your methods, human methods to try to get safety, to try to get peace with God, to try to secure yourself will come short. I, I don't know if it's done here in Britain, but um, in America, we have a little trick that's often played at camps. Cindy at one of the women's camps did this. <laughs> and did this to some of the people in the bed. It's called short sheeting. 
and uh, I don't know exactly how it's done, um, but an inner sheet is is tucked in and made short, and then the regular duvet or whatever is put on the outside, so the bed looks normal. Pull back the cover, you, you go to get in, the sheets are too short, the bed's too short, it doesn't work, you can't get in, you've been short sheeted. And that's kind of like what God's saying here. The method you try, you think you're going to make a nice peaceful bed to lie in, but you're going to be short sheeted. You are, are, are it's, it's going to fall short. You can't do it with yourself. <laughs> and that's why it's saying the covering will not cover you. It's not horrible. You know, you have a cover and like your feet stick out from a bed. That's just so, I, I don't know, that's a miserable thing to me. I just don't like that when the, when the, 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 bed sheets, the bed coverings are, are too short, too narrow. And, uh, you know, the arm sticks out and it gets cold. It wakes you up in the night, your feet stick out from the end of the bed. You know, that's the type of things. Doing it with human methods, going to come short. Trusting the Lord, obeying scripture, following what God says to do. Ah, that will give you rest. That will give you peace. Verses 21-22, for the Lord will rise up as on Mount Perazim, as in the valley of Gibeon, he will be roused to do his deed. Strange is his deed. Alien is his work. Now therefore do not scoff, lest your bonds be made strong. You be imprisoned. For I have heard a decree of destruction from the Lord God of hosts against the whole land. I love this verse 21. First, Mount Parazim. The word Parazim means breaking through. Uh, we, we, the, this name comes from uh, a time of King David. David actually had just been anointed king. The Philistines heard of it. And they came on the attack to get him, to kill him. Um, and they met uh, near a place. Well, I'll read what it says in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 20. And David came to Baal Perazim. And David defeated them, the Philistines, there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a bursting flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim, or the Lord of the Breaking Through. When the enemy came against him, the Lord gave David and the people of Judah, of Israel at that time, we're all one, uh, victory. The Lord burst through the enemy and gave them power and strength. That's the Mount Perazim. In the Valley of Gibeon, um, it was the place where Joshua, when they were taking the promised land, defeated the five kings of the Amorites. Now they came against uh, the uh, people of Gibeon. People of Gibeon were those people who tricked Joshua into making peace with them. And Joshua the Lord called him to honor the peace treaty he made with the people of Gibeon. When the nations around them heard that the people of Gibeon had made peace with Joshua and the people of Israel, they came in attack against Gibeon. So the people of Gibeon sent Joshua a message and said, hey, please honor your uh, treaty with us and come and help us. And he did, traveling overnight to um, the valley of Gibeon. And there we read in Joshua 10, verse 10, And the Lord threw them in a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon, and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon, and struck them as far as Azekah and Mekedah. Uh, that helps. <laughs> anyway, these are both places of great victory, with the Lord coming through. Um, and, uh, and, and surprising and unusual circumstance. Time of victory. Not what they're going to ultimately possess against the people of Assyria and for Judah, the people of Babylon. 
so he goes on to say, and this 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 just really ministers to me. I love this verse twenty one. He says, uh, he says, you know, as in the valley of Gibeon, he God will be roused to do his deed. Strange is his deed, and alien is his work. Um, other versions where it says strange is his deed use words like awesome is his deed or unexpected, unusual, peculiar. And where it says alien is his work, other some other versions use unusual or unfamiliar. The Lord did something very, very different here. Dave Guzak comments, in those cases of, of Gibeon and Mount Perazim, the breaking through, uh, the Lord fought for Israel. But if her leaders did not repent, they would soon find the Lord fighting against Israel. This use of God's strength against his people is surely his awesome or strange work. But I think a little bit more about this. In the Lord breaking through for us gives a picture of the gospel story. And it is strange thing, an alien work. Um, think of it. Who would, th who would think of it? It makes no sense. It's strange. It's odd. It's alien to our way of thinking. To, to, to think that God would become a human being, would put aside his divinity, his God, godhood, and become a human being born as a helpless babe on Christmas Day, would raise up an obscurity in a poor family, and then rise up from nothingness proclaiming he's God, would get arrested, would get killed, crucified as a criminal, but on the third day would rise from the dead and then ascend to heaven. That's a strange work. That's an alien deed. Who would have thought? It just goes against human sense and human logic. God's work is, I, I, I love it, you know? It's a strange work. It's an alien deed. <laughs> or a strange deed, alien work. So when you hear the gospel, as it says in verse 22, do not scoff. Do not make fun of it. Do not aside and say, uh, you know, that's good for some, but not for me. Oh, we need to make it our own. Verse 22, I'll read it again. Thou, now, therefore, do not scoff, lest your bonds be made strong, lest you be put in the prison, held there forever. For I have heard a decree of dis destruction from the Lord God of hosts against the whole land because they turned their back on him. But God does not want to harm us. He wants to help us. God wants to give us a future and a hope. The Lord came to earth and died for you. He wants you. He chooses you. Do not scoff. He wants to reap a harvest, and it's a gentle harvest. Listen to how this chapter ends. From verse 23. Give ear and hear my voice. Give attention and hear my speech. He's speaking to the people of Jerusalem, the south. Does he who plows for sowing plow continually? Does he continually open and harrow uh, the ground when he has leveled its surface? Does he not scatter dill, sow cumin, 
and put in wheat in rows and barley in his proper place and emer as the border? For he is rightly instructed, his God teaches him. Dill is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over cumin, but dill is beaten out with a stick and cumin with a rod. Does one crush grain for bread? No, he does not thresh it forever. When he drives his cartwheel over it with his horses, does he not crush it? This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. Like you said, give ear, you know, listen, you people of Jerusalem. It, it gives a, a beautiful picture. Does he continually, you would never see a farmer, you know, we look out on the fields over here. I love watching the farmers work and uh, fascinated by work, I, I, hard work. I can watch it all day. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, when they have to dig up the ground for a new crop, uh, they do it once. They just dig it up, they herald the rows, they turn the soil, and get it ready for planting. Don't, he said, it would be see, silly to come back after they turned it and to go again and go again and go again and just keep digging up and turning over and scratching through and digging up and, and that. And that's not how God works. We think he's he might be angry at us and it's like, always putting us through things he's you know digging up our lives he's digging in he's making it hurt he's turning things over it can't be settled god doesn't work that way he says he doesn't do this it doesn't this is a a farmer doesn't do it the lord doesn't do that no he says he does a work maybe a painful work to go through but it's in preparation for planting which is in preparation for reaping a harvest and then when the harvest time comes, he says here, it's done in the proper way. Um, he doesn't, you know, beat to death the little fine dill seeds, but just, you know, it just gives it a tap with the thing, blows it open, up and let the wind blow off the chaff and does that. They don't, you know, crush it under a heavy wheel. Uh, even, even wheat. Uh, it, it's, it's threshed in the proper way and then crushed just in the right way. It's not over crushed. It's not crushed to death. It's not crushed to uselessness. And the Lord is like that in his harvesting. Uh, Dave Guzik, uh, again, uh, writes this about this section. He says, the end of Isaiah 28 is a poem relating the work of God to the work of a farmer. A farmer doesn't only plow. He knows when to stop plowing and when to level the ground, when to plant and what to plant where. He uses different tools at different times and works them all together to produce crops. In the same way, God knows what instruments to use in our life and what time to use them. We don't have to doubt or despair at what God is doing in our lives because he is an expert farmer working on us with all his wisdom. He quotes another commentator. He says, he used the proper instrument and procedure at the proper time to accomplish his purposes among his stubborn people. <laughs> so sometimes it takes a little more work than us, and sometimes we make God work a little bit more than uh, he would like by, by being severed. But through it all, he knows what to do. He knows how to do it. He knows what we need. He won't go too far. He won't come too short because as it ended, he is wonderful in counsel. You know, these are the same words that describe the Messiah in an uh, earlier chapter of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, 
when he is called a wonderful counselor. The Lord is wonderful counselor. He is excellent in wisdom. And he has given us his word. He has spoken to us and given us his word where we can get counsel and receive wisdom as we study the word of God, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So I pray you have received wisdom and have received counsel tonight as we have line upon line gone through this chapter. Well, that ends Isaiah for tonight. And this ends our uh, uh, weekly midweek Bible studies uh, till the end of summer. We won't be having um, any more midweek studies in uh, uh, July or August. And we'll start again sometime in September. I think we have a date in um, second half of September. Uh, so, you know, I look forward to seeing you again. When we come back, we'll be uh, continuing in Isaiah with the Lord's message to Jerusalem, to the southern kingdom for a few chapters before we get in there, using the events of their lives to teach eternal lessons. So let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the precepts you've given us, the lines upon lines that we read. And Lord, we can take it here a little, there a little. We don't have to take it all in at once. We take it in best as we get a little here and a little there. And we thank you, Lord, for this little, though some might think, wow, this is a lot tonight. Uh, Father, but you are good as you give us your word. Lord, thank you that you know what you're doing. You deal with us with wonderful counsel. You are excellent in wisdom. And we give you praise and thanks to know that we have you. Thank you, Lord, for the, the strange work, the alien deeds you did through Christ and with him, that work you did in Zion. So Lord, we bless you and we thank you. We praise you for your word. Amen. So the Lord bless you. The Lord, I, the Lord bless your summer. Bless your, your days and your weeks. The Lord keep you. The Lord be pleased with you, making his face shine upon you. May the Lord give you grace. May the Lord fill you with peace. Um, have a, a blessed night. Have a glorious summer. We'll be seeing you soon. I love you guys. God bless you. Bye-bye.